What is up everybody? We are back with another Wash the Bros video. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, we are here with Jonathan Wright, who's going to show us how to tie some blue water trolling rigs. He's going to show us how to tie them, how to use them, and when to use them, and why to use them. <laughs> wire to work with, just because there's no point in having to start over if you don't have enough wire. I mean, you better just take enough. So you'll pinch it, and we call this the haywire twist. And all you're going to do is just wrap your tag end around your long end. And you'll do that enough that a weight will be able to sit in between the hook and the pin that goes into the ballyhoo's head. So that's generally you know, three quarters of an inch, somewhere in there. You wanna to try to keep these, these rolls pretty tight so that you can fit the uh, the weight over it. This is another important part. You want to put your weight on your rig before you do anything else. If you get further down in the process, it becomes a little more difficult. You just shove that weight right down so it should sit as so. And so then you're going to do your barrel turn. And that will be a more condensed version of your haywire twist. As you can see, it kind of spreads along the wire. This will be a tight fit coming down the wire now. Make a little more sense when I show it to you. And again, you'll see that the barrel roll is tighter than your original haywire that the, the weight will go over. And in theory, that should be able to slide so that you can attach it to a ballyhoo of any size. And then again, you wanna leave that pin so that you can put it through the ballyhoo's head. Um, on my naked rigs, I do it a little differently. I actually prefer to use a lot of people call it copper, but it's, it's basically just a thin wire that will wrap around the ballyhoo's head. Uh, that just gives it a little, uh, a better swimming motion opposed to the spring. When you, when you can't hide it with a skirt, it just uh, looks a little better when you wrap it with your copper wire. And so that's what we'll do. The process for getting that on the hook, and I do leave that on the hook. So you generally wrap it through the hole, wrap it around the hook once, and then come back through your original wrap because you want your wire coming down outside of your hook. That is a fun process, as you might imagine. And you'll pull it through. That way it'll stay attached to the hook. And again, you want your pin on the same plane as your hook, and then your wire will hang down and you will wrap it around your belly hoop. Same thing will happen on the swivel end. And again, we're not doing a skirt, but if you want to put a skirt on this, you can just slide it right on, on the swivel end. Just pinch the wire up. Give yourself plenty of wire to work with. And then wrap her. And you can start faster with the barrel twist on this one because you don't have to account for a weight taking up some space. Um, so it's good. The way I was taught to break wire to avoid sharp edges is to make a small bend in it and then almost ride it like a bicycle just around and around until it pops off. That way you don't have a sharp edge on your roll. And so that would be your naked wahoo rig. And you generally want these, you know, four to eight feet of wire depending on preference obviously. Um, but that's a, a great rig to run low, especially in you know, maybe a, a cloudier water scenario. Um, great chance to catch water. Or this is 80 pound liter. I prefer 80 pound. It's not too heavy. It's easy to work with. Um, you seem to get enough bites and it's rare that you get bit off. And you, usually if you do, it's probably a Wahoo, something with some teeth, um, maybe a King mackerel out in the Gulf Stream. Um, so the way you'll fasten everything on this rig is you'll start with the swivel. We'll start from the, uh, the ground up. We'll start from the swivel, 
front of the reel. As you can see, that is crimped. Um, and that is a size one crimp. And the way you want to do it is you want to mushroom the loop end of your crimp so it doesn't uh, cut the line. And then you'll obviously close down the other side of it as well as you can because there's only one stream of line that really matters and so you can afford to get a little tighter on that side. And you always want to test it. Try to give it a good yank. If it slides any, cut it and start again. Because um, you, you don't want this, this to be the difference in your fish catching. Um, and on the other end, or excuse me, let me start with our, our skirt. This is just a mini jag. I hadn't really used it a whole lot, but uh, I generally fish with a skirt on my baits. You can do a naked ballyhoo, but I think the skirt's added some character, um, especially if you're seeing a lot of a certain type of bait in the water. You may want to run something that kind of mirrors that bait. Like I said, the purple um, Wahoo rig mimics Bonita, which is a primary uh, food source for Wahoo. Um, then we'll get down to the business end. Um, I use springs when I'm using a skirted rig. And so the, the spring will be pretty easily, uh, just throw it, feed it down. And then again, you'll be crimping and you'll want to make sure that your weight is on the opposite side that your hook faces. So you can see that this weight will go underneath the gills of the ballyhoo, like right here, and the hook will come out the bottom. And then so that you want to make sure that you don't uh, mess up and put the weight on the bottom because then you will be unable to successfully uh, rig the fish up. I generally recommend uh, medium or small ballyhoo when you're mahi, mahi fishing. Um, if you've got some yellow fins in the area, you could start thinking about, you know, your larger ballyhoo. Um, and then if you're bill fishing, you'll probably want to use mediums and larges. Um, especially blue marlin fishing. If you're sailfish, we eat just about anything that flaps in front of them. Um, and then when you start talking about selects, you better be talking about a bluefin tuna, something really, really big. But like I said, this is all gonna be like your mahi, smaller tuna species, wahoo stuff. So we'll just use this for an example. Um, and then again, like I said, you'll wanna make sure that you mushroom your crimp as you do it. And you cannot forget that when you are using your spring you need a pin to go in i usually use my wire um 93 pound mallon wire and just stick it right in that crimp this is kind of the, the harder part do it like this first so you'll stick your pin right in the crimp with the line make sure it comes out the other side and then you'll fasten it down and always make sure you crimp it well that's just something that is very controllable but can be the difference in catching or losing a fish so you really want to take some time make sure it's nicely nicely done as you can see, this is a really huge pin. What you'll do, you just push it right up and you want it to be on the same plane as your hook, just like that. Should, should walk the same line. And actually, I'll probably trim this up. That pin's a little tall. It'd be kind of hard to get through a, a ballyhoo. But that's pretty much there all, all there is to it. Um, I generally like to have you know, 10, 12 feet in my mahi rigs. Uh, you take a couple wraps and get the fish in pretty quickly, usually be how it works and there's a fluorocarbon mahi rig so what we're working with here is just a i've got a bucket here that uh all my stuff is kept in um and these are just a few different rigs uh the important thing to remember is when you're trolling you want to vary your colors until you've got it kind of dialed in a lot of blue water fishing is obviously going to be going out there and finding it because you're really just fishing a huge mass of water so you have to look for things like temperature breaks and color changes and that's what you're looking for and so when you in the same vein that you look for things in the water you also want to deploy baits that will have you know different looks and different uh, actions as they go through the water to increase your chances and then you'll try to to figure out whether they're biting then you'll obviously uh want to deploy more of those baits but just uh 
rudimentary analysis here. Um, this is like a very simple lure rig. Um, and as you can see, there's a few different sizes of uh, line that we like to use. I am a proponent of the 80 uh, pound leader um, and fluorocarbon has always worked better for me. Um, mono rigs certainly work, but fluoro would be uh, almost invisible in, in the water and, and probably is your best use. Um, and then for a lot of us uh, North Carolinians, we like to do some wahoo fishing. So we'll actually use this hard wire too. I like to use the, the Mallon 93 pound hard wire. And sometimes I'll run a naked rig. Sometimes I'll put a nice little skirt. This one's a little purple, kind of like a Bonita or something like that. Um, and so if you're wahoo fishing, you'll, you'll want to have several of these when you go. Um, there's a few discrepancies in how you tie these rigs. Um, when you're running a big head like this, that's, that's more of a lure. You don't actually tie it to include um, the pin that will allow it to run a ballyhoo along with it. Whereas with these smaller rigs that have smaller skirts on them, you're going to have the pin that runs along underneath the, the or excuse me, in front of the weight um, that will go through the nose of the ballyhoo. And that will be uh, you know, pretty important. Um, and then obviously your wire rig is going to have the same thing just wrapped into it. Um, all these are, are somewhat similar. They're kind of like the chugger head or the uh, jet head lures. I generally use an eight alt hook, seven alt hook, somewhere in there, depending on what you're going for. You know, you've got some smaller fish in the area, you probably want to go smaller hooks, but that's obviously a feel thing. Um, if you want to get fancy, you can, you know, take some of these little miniature squid and make a daisy chain on, on top of your uh, rig. That's a, a really popular bait in May uh, when there's lots of mahi moving up of the coast. Um, that is a killer. Um, when you're running the wire, you're probably looking for wahoo. Um, and a lot of times king mackerel will be caught in the Gulf Stream too. Um, and the nice thing about the wire is it's really tough to bite through. Um, so you, you probably won't get bit off when you're fishing that kind of bait if you do catch a mahi or something. But I think that it yields less bites than the fluorocarbon and even the mono. Um, for, for a rig like this, that's, this uh, will actually provide like a, a chugging action as it goes through the water. Um, with the ballyhoo swimming behind it, obviously. So that'll probably attract tuna and mahi primarily. Uh, now I've caught wahoo on that rig, actually. Um, we got lucky. As you can see, that fluorocarbon's not a whole lot. You would not want a wahoo on there if you could help it. But we've gotten lucky and, and gotten them in on that. Caught them just in the corner of the mouth, perfect. Um, but again, th that kind of rig's gonna be a tuna, mahi. Sailfish will definitely go after it, especially if you're a little further south from North Carolina. Um, then when you start working into these larger rigs, you'll start seeing your billfish, um, pretty much anything. You, you, a large mahi would probably eat this because he thinks it's a smaller mahi, but it's a really great bait for billfish because they eat mahi primarily, um, along with bonita and a few other species. Um, and so this rig will, come through the water and attract a lot of attention because of the size of it obviously it's disrupting a lot of water and that'll often lead to bites um, but things like this will still catch wahoo and sailfish anything so you never really know that's the fun of blue water fishing i grew up fishing uh, at ocean isle beach um, among other places um, but then i really got into it uh, when i went to college i started mating at the Ocean Isle Fishing Center. As you can tell, I uh, still am a fan of those guys down there. Uh, Captain Acock, really good. I made it for what will be four years now, uh, on and off, definitely during the summers, almost every day, um, and just developed a real love for it. Um, and I, my favorite thing to do in the world is to sit here and, and formulate ideas and tie new rigs and try to catch more fish. Um, so I really enjoy this. You got um, any funny stories or serious story, funny and a serious story of <laughs> fishing? A uh, funny story would be one morning in the middle of summer, we're going every day just as hard as we can, charter fishing, taking people out at you know, six o'clock in the morning is, is departure. And then oftentimes not getting off until you know six, seven o'clock by the time we uh, clean the boats. Uh, so it was six o'clock in the morning and we were going king mackerel fishing that day. We had a six, two six hours, but we had our first six hour. And we were looking for bait, scanning across the, uh, the beach as we 
as we were kind of making our, our trek to uh, one of the rocks out there, close to Ocean Isle, good kingfish rock. And uh, we found bait, sure enough, I'd get up on the bow and we fish on these uh, world cat catamaran style boats. And so I get on the bow to throw the cast net to catch uh, pogies or menhaden, it's commonly called. Um, and I threw the net and pancaked it, right? Every time. Um, <laughs> and as I watched the net go, I saw the, the uh, line that goes above the net that's supposed to be attached to my hand go right off my hand and go straight into the water with the net. And I kind of like scratched my head for a second because it was six o'clock in the morning and I was like, oh crap, what do I do now? Uh, and I looked around and I took my phone out of my pocket, put it on the ground and just hopped on in and tried to swim away with what was like a 30 pound cast net, which didn't go well. Um, and so eventually my captain, Captain OC, he's another great captain of the fishing center, um, <laughs> grabbed the gaff and uh, grabbed the net first. He wasn't really that concerned with me. Um, and then he uh, backed the boat in so that I could get in. Um, and we went on our merry way. But that was a fun, fun start to the morning and uh, definitely got a, a, a nice tip from our customers because uh, they thought I was going the extra mile. I was really just acting like an idiot. Um, and th the best part about that was I tied my shirt to the T-top and let it dry out on the way to our, our spot. That was kind of fun. So a serious fishing story would be uh, Austin Acock, the captain I mentioned earlier, and I were fishing off of Ocean Island, the Gulf Stream, and it was early summer, um, probably late June, somewhere in there, and we were mahi fishing, and we had a spread of you know stuff like this, it's all fluorocarbon, 80 pound leader, uh, nothing heavy out, and we were fishing uh, TLD 25, so not a very heavy reel, but perfect for mahi fishing. And we would had a few bites. I think we had a couple fish in the box. And all of a sudden, our uh, long rigger just screams, screams, burning down, burning down, burning down. And I was like, oh, wow, that's probably a good fish, you know, probably a large black fin, maybe a, a bigger mahi, bull mahi. And uh, sure enough, the reel just kept spinning. And finally, we were like, okay, we'll start, we'll start kind of making our way over there because we don't want to get spooled or anything. And the fish just, just keep on going and it's going down, 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 down. And so our initial thought was, huh, it must be a shark because that's kind of how sharks act. So as the fish is burning down this reel, we start making our way back towards the fish because we're about to get spooled. And our charter customer grabs the rod and says, hey, uh, what do we do if we run out of line? And Austin and I just said, what? And we looked and I think there was probably 15 uh, wraps of line left on the spool and Austin floors the boat, not really, but he puts it in pretty good motion straight at the fish and I grab the rod and just start cranking as fast as I can, fast as I can, and then hand it directly back to the customer. And we, we got the fish under control, we got everything out and we ended up doing battle with this fish for about an hour and a half and it was a great tail and the whole time it had dove down to about 100 feet we could see it on our depth finder and so we were taking taking guesses about what it is we thought it might be a shark maybe a really big billfish that was just kind of staying down could barely feel that tiny uh reel but it ended up being a uh, yellowfin tuna and the really cool thing about that story is no one had caught a yellowfin tuna out of Ocean Isle Beach before 2020 in about 15 years. So that was a really cool time to catch a yellowfin off of Ocean Isle. Well, my name's Jonathan Wright and I hope this uh, rig tying and kind of information system has been helpful. Um, I want to say thank you to Washley Bros for allowing me to uh, talk on their platform and uh, hope more content ensues.